Hello everybody, I am Kimo Honor Jam and uh, as usual I am your physics teacher today. The title of the lesson today is called The Art of Measurements. By the end of today you should be able to explain the basic nature of physics and the scientific process. You should be able to define a unit and state all the fundamental quantities as well as their corresponding units. And most importantly, you should be able to convert from one unit system to another. Now let's talk about the nature of physics. Physics, why is it so important? that you have to spend a whole year studying it. Why is physics so important that most universities, as a matter of fact, all universities, most especially the engineering departments, the College of Medicines, the science, the physical science, and even the social sciences require their students to study physics. What is it about this subject that is so important that everybody wants you to know about it? Briefly today, I will be able to answer the question, why is physics so important? Why is physics so fundamental? Now, the word physics comes from the Greek word physist, meaning the knowledge of the natural world the knowledge of the natural world. In simple terms, physics is the study of nature. When we talk about nature, we mean the world around us. And the major goal or the main or the primary goal of physics is to decode or uncover the laws governing nature. The universe primarily is made up of two commodities. It's made up of matter and their energy. And if physics is the study of nature, if physics' main goal is to uncover the laws governing the universe, it makes sense to conclude that physics is the study of matter and energy. Let me be very clear. All forms of life in the universe, including humans, are governed by the laws of nature. And it is the job of a physicist to uncode, to decode, or uncover these laws. This therefore implies that physics is essential to the understanding of life. In other words, if you, if your actions, your decisions are going to be based on the laws that govern life on earth, it essentially implies that physics is the part and parcel of your life. As a matter of fact, without physics, life on earth would be impossible to live because all of us and anything on earth, including automobiles, airplanes, hovercrafts, whatever you call it or name it, all of these things function by obeying the laws of physics. And uh, it is my intention throughout this course to be able to unveil some of these laws to you. Now, AP Physics Mechanics strictly deals with Newtonian physics. In other words, AP Physics is concerned with Newtonian mechanics which is basically the study of motion. So throughout this course, I'm going to unravel or unveil to you some of the fundamental laws that can be used to predict the motion of systems under the action of forces. Now, first thing I'd like for you to know about the nature of physics is that physics itself is an empirical science. 
What do I mean when I say physics is an empirical science? It is an empirical science because it's based on two things, observation and experimentation. Listen carefully. It's empirical in nature because it's based on observation and experimentation. Now you will soon realize that without these two, physics itself will not be physics. Because of our curiosity, we make observations of the world around us. When we make observations, what happens? We do ask questions. In order to answer the questions, we develop hypotheses. Basically, a hypothesis is a prediction of the behavior of a system under a certain set of circumstances. When I use the word systems, what do I mean? A system is a, one of those words that mean different things to different people. But in the realm of physics, the word system is simple. It is anything in which our interest is focused on. It is anything in which we are currently talking about. Now, if you are holding a book in your hand and you are focused on that book, that book is a system. Unlike in biology in which a system is a collection of organs or cells that group to perform a given function, in physics, a system itself can be animate or inanimate, in which case it is anything under study. Now there are different kinds of systems which we are going to talk about this um, in the next video, but what you need to understand is that our curious observation causes us to ask questions. In order to answer these questions, we make predictions. We make predictions. These predictions are what we call hypotheses. A hypothesis basically is the anticipated answer to the question which you have posed. In other words, a hypothesis is a predicted relationship between two or more physical quantities under a given set of circumstances. Now, these predictions may be true or not. So to determine, the, to determine whether a prediction is correct or incorrect, what happens? Physicists design experiments in the lab and actually conduct these experiments to obtain data. Understand that to validate these predictions or hypotheses, repeated experiments are conducted. The results of these experiments is the collection of data. When this data is collected, it is analyzed. It is analyzed, most probably with the use of statistical and mathematical methods. With the results obtained from this analysis can either verify whether the hypothesis is true or is false. If the hypothesis is true, listen carefully now, if the hypothesis is true and can independently be verified by different investigators at different locations yet and leads to the same conclusion, then this hypothesis can either be termed a theory or a law. Let me say that again. We begin by asking questions. Our questions help us to design hypotheses. A hypothesis is just a predictable, meaningful relationship between two or more physical quantities under a given set of circumstances. In simple terms, a hypothesis is an anticipated answer to a question that you've posed due to your observation of the world around you. 
in order to verify this hypothesis, in order to verify these predictions, we need to carry out experiments. If our experimental results prove that our hypothesis is correct, which and can independently be verified by different investigators, then that hypothesis may become a physical law or a theory. What this implies, what this means, is that all theories, all physical laws in physics must be verifiable. All physical laws must be testable. Now, all physical laws must be verifiable or testable. All scientific and theories and laws must be testable by experiment. Must be test all scientific laws and theories must be testable by experiment. To summarize, to summarize, we begin by asking by making observations. Our curious observations help us to ask questions. In order to answer these questions, we develop hypotheses. A hypothesis is basically a prediction. To test the correctness of our predictions, we carry out experiments. Our experiments gives us data. The data by itself is meaningless. But when analyzed with the appropriate analytical methods, we get results. The results can either prove whether our predictions or hypotheses are true or they are false. 1. If the results indicate that our hypothesis is true and the results, if the results can independently be verified by different physicists or scientists, in other parts of the world, then that hypothesis will either become a law or a theory. So the question I'm posting you is, what is the difference between a law and a theory in science? But if the hypothesis, if the, if the, if the data analysis shows that the prediction is not correct, two things can happen. Either the hypothesis is scrapped away, or thrown away or modified and the experiments rerun. In most cases, it is modified and rerun. So you see that the scientific process is cyclical. Now, it is usually much more complicated than this, but to give you an overview and a simplified view of how things work in physics and how the, the scientific process carry on, I have given you a simplified model of the scientific process. Now we talked about the fact that physics itself is an, an experimental or an empirical science. Now the reason we said it was an empirical science is because the foundation of physics is based on two things, observations and experimentations. In other words, all laws in physics should be testable and must be testable by experiments. On the other hand, physics itself is a quantitative science. Quantitative science. Now, physics deals with measurable quantities. In other words, physics only handles quantifiable things, quantifiable attributes of nature. Anything that is quantifiable is measurable. In other words, Quantifiability implies measurement. Quantifiability, any attribute of the natural world, such as length, width, height, volume, density, area, force, humidity, pressure, that can be measured is a physical quantity. In other words, a physical quantity is any quantity that can be measured. Now the reason physics 
is so different from religion is that physics itself deals with measurable quantities. On the other hand, religion deals with things that cannot be physically be measured, such as love. There is no love o meter. In other words, we cannot really quantify how much I love you. Faith, which is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, as defined in the Bible in Hebrew 11 verse 1, you cannot really measure the quantity of faith an individual has physically. But we know that your faith grows as you listen to the Word of God. On the other hand, physics, unlike religion, deals with things that we can physically measure. That we can physically measure. One of the, the most important objective of physics is to uncover the meaningful relationship that exists between physical quantities. Now, let me say this again. One of the major, major goal of physics is to uncover the meaningful relationships that exist between different physical quantities. Now, let us recap the main points. If I'm you, I'm going to put this down on your summary box. Physics is the study of the natural world. In other words, physics is the study of the universe with one purpose to uncover the laws that govern the universe. Because all laws, because all life in the universe, including yours, is governed by laws of nature, implies physics is essential to you, to the way you live, and to the decisions you make. And that is why this course is very important in your life. Thirdly, Physics is an empirical science because its foundation is built upon two words, observation and experimentation. Now there is a link between observation and experimentation. When we observe, we see patterns, we ask questions. Our questions lead us to form hypotheses. In order to verify the correctness of our hypotheses, we carry out experiments. This experiment gives rise to data which when analyzed can either prove the correctness of our theory or hypothesis or the incorrectness of it. Physics, on the other hand, is a quantitative science. The word quantitative here implies that physics only deals with things that can be quantifiable. In other words, physics deals with measurable quantities of nature. Any attribute of nature that can be measured, that can physically be measured, is called a physical quantity. It is the job of a physicist to find a pattern the meaningful relationship that exists between all the physical quantities that there is. Understand that experimentation involves measurement. Listen to the link, observations, questions, hypotheses, experimentations. Now, experimentations involves measurements. It is practically impossible for us to do experiments without measuring something. But then, what is measurement? In simple terms, measurement is an act of comparison. Take for example, let's say this is your first time in this class and you know nobody and you want to compare a friend you've just made. In order for you to adequately compare A to B, you must know one. In other words, for measurements to be meaningful, there must be a standard against which 
everything else is measured. If we measure the length of a table and we say that it is, for example, 10 meters, what does that mean? 10 is a number which signifies how much, how large is the table compared to the standard, the meter. In other words, to measure a physical quantity, we compare it with some precisely defined standard. This standard is what we call the unit of measurement. In other words, the unit of a physical quantity is a measure of that physical quantity. Therefore, every measurement, listen to me now, therefore, every measurement has two important parts, a number and a unit. The number tells us the relative magnitude of that particular physical quantity to the standard, which is the unit. And the unit itself tells us helps us to identify that particular physical measurement. For example, if I tell you that if we say a measured quantity X is 6, what does this stand for? I don't know. But if we say that if we say that it is six meters or six meters or let me say six kilograms, this will stand for a length and this will stand for a mass. So you realize that the presence of a unit help us to identify whether it's a length. The presence of a kilograms help us to identify that particular unit. Therefore, it is critical. Therefore, it is critical for you to understand this, that every measurement must have a number and a unit. Without the unit, it will be impossible to identify that particular physical quantity. And that is why in this class, you will have to, what, whether it is a measurement in the lab or an answer in class, it must be accompanied by the correct unit, by the correct unit. Otherwise, your measurement or your answer will be meaningless. And that will cost you some currency, grades. And if you don't want grades to be gone, remember, to include the appropriate units in every answer, in every measurement that you will make in this class. Units are defined arbitrarily. In other words, units are fixed by definition and are independent of any physical conditions, such as, for example, temperature, pressure, humidity, etc., etc. In other words, a unit in China should correspond exactly to the same unit in the United States of America. A unit somewhere in Africa should correspond exactly to the same unit in the UK. In other words, environmental conditions should not affect the unit of measure of a physical quantity. As a result, the unit of a physical quantity is fixed or precisely defined to be independent of any environmental conditions. And for this to be possible, there are three properties exhibited by every unit. One, all units are reproducible. Two, they are indestructible. 
and 3. They do not change. They are invariable. They are irreproducible. In other words, reproducibility is the ability to produce the same results under the same circumstances. Listen carefully. For something, when something is said to be reproducible, it means that the same results will be obtained under the same set of circumstances, irrespective of where you are. Indestructible meaning it cannot be destroyed. A no-brainer. Units should not change. As a result, they are invariable. What you need to understand is that there are different systems of unit. You have the customary system of unit and you have the international systems of unit. Listen carefully, fellas. You have different systems of units. You have what we call the customary system of units and you have the international system of unit otherwise known as the metric system. Otherwise known as the metric system. In the international system of units, there are seven base or fundamental quantities what do I mean by a fundamental quantity a fundamental or base quantity is any quantity in science whose measurement does not depend on the measurement of any other quantity let me say that again a fundamental quantity is any quantity in science whose measurement does not depend on the measurement of any other quantity there are seven base of fundamental quantities as a result, there are seven bays of fundamental unit. You have mass measured in kilograms. You have length measured in meters. You have time measured in seconds. You have temperature measured in kelvins. You have the amount of substance measured in moles. Remember in chemistry, the mole is defined to be the amount of substance that contains 12 grams of carbon-12 isotopes. Now you have electric current measured in amperes and luminous intensity measured in candida. These are the seven base quantities or base units. Any other units are derived units. Any other units are derived units. Now, one of the, the things you need to bear in mind is that the same physical quantity can have several units take for example time the unit of measure of time is the seconds hour minute days years all of these are units for time. This means 
that a given physical quantity can have more than two units. Therefore, it is crucial for you to be able to convert from one unit system to another. And for us to do this, we use conversion factors. Let me put it this way. It is very possible for the same or for a given physical quantity to have more than two units. Time, for example, is measured in seconds, in minutes, in hours, in days, in weeks, in months, in years, in centuries, in decades, and so on and so forth. Length is measured in meters, centimeters, kilometers, yard, foot, and miles, and so on and so forth. So it's very possible for you to encounter a given physical quantities given in an unconventional unit system. Therefore, it is critical in this class for you to understand how to convert from one unit system to the other. Now, because sometimes different units get really large, we employ what we call prefaces. Prefaces. And on the board, we have a couple. The preface Geiger is simply just 10 raised to the power 9. You have mega, kilo, deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, pico, fento. Fento is actually the smallest. So you should be aware of this. For example, um, one kilometers is equivalent to what? 10 to the 3 meters. That's what that means. Now, we should be able to convert from one unit system to another. For example, let's say we want to convert 500 milligrams of aspirin to, let me say, grams. What are we going to do in this case? What really do we do in this case? So for us to convert 500 milligrams of aspirin, let's say, let's make it more fun, to kilograms. What procedure do we follow? First, we know that um, one milligram is equivalent to one We know that 1 milligram is equivalent to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 grams. And we also know that 1 kilogram is equivalent to 1.0 times 10 to the 3 grams. So, Five hundred milligrams will be equal to or equivalent to five hundred milligrams divided by one multiply by one point zero times ten to the negative three grams. divided by 
one milligram multiplied by one kilogram divided by 1.0 times 10 to the 3 grams what do you realize the milligrams will cancel the grams will cancel and if you solve all of this you will have 5.0 times 10 to the negative 4 kilograms Thank you for your thank you for your time. Now before we wrap up, let us summarize the main points. Physics is the study of the natural world and relies on observation and experimentations. Our observations cause us to ask questions. Our questions cause us to form hypotheses. In order to verify these hypotheses, we carry out experiments. These experiments give rise to data which we analyze. By analyzing this data, we usually decide whether our hypotheses are correct or not. If it is correct, and our results can independently be verified by several different investigators, then our hypothesis will either become a law or a theory. On the other hand, another most important factor that I need for you to understand is the fact that physics is a quantitative science, meaning that it deals with things that can be quantifiable. Any attribute of nature that is quantifiable is called a physical quantity. Any attribute of nature that is measurable is called a physical quantity. And therefore, physics, unlike religion, deals with physical quantities. And this is really important because physics is an experimental science. When we talk about experiments, we mean measurements. To measure is to compare. And to compare, we need to have a standard upon which we are comparing whatever we are comparing to. And the standard of comparison in physics is called a unit. In other words, a unit is a measure of a physical quantity. Now, there are different types of physical quantities. You have fundamental physical quantities. And you have derived physical quantities. A fundamental or base physical quantity is a physical quantity whose magnitude can be measured directly without the aid of any other physical quantities. Examples include length, mass, time, electric current, the amount of substance. Now, derived physical quantities are physical quantities whose measurement depends upon the measurement of base quantities. For example, to measure the, 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 the area of a table, you need to measure the, the length and the width. To measure the force applied on an object, let me say to measure the pressure, you need to measure what the surface area as well as what the force applied on it. Now, because there are two classes of physical quantities, there are also two classes of units. You have base units and you have derived units. A base unit is a unit of measure of a base quantity, and a derived unit is a unit of measure of a derived quantity. According to the SI system of units, there are seven base units, upon which all other units are derived. And to end this lesson, because a given physical quantity can have several different units, it is critical and crucial in this class for you to be able to convert from one unit system to the other. And we do this by means of a conversion factor. Our next lecture will be on dimensional analysis. Thank you and remain blessed.